was this, an ice pick. It's the sort of thing you'd have found in every 1940s home. It was absolutely perfect for what he needed it for. It was hard, it was tough, it did the job. So what Freeman did is he would anaesthetise the patient using ECT, then he would get his ice pick and a hammer and he would go in to the brain through here. I think I'll try it on a skull rather than myself. Here it is. Watch closely. He's going in here. He pushes the eyeball out of the way and he works his way to the back to a thin bit of bone right at the back. And then what you do is you bop it, bop it through the skull. Yep, going through, going about five centimetres, and then you just squiggle it around. He was actually much more adept than I was, but he would use two at the same time. And then out it comes. And according to Freeman, the only post-operative care the patient needed was a pair of dark glasses. Transorbital lobotomy was so simple, it could be done by anyone, anywhere, and in under 10 minutes. Walter Freeman performed thousands of lobotomies. His technique spread so widely, it's estimated that more than 100,000 people were lobotomized, with mixed results. They had their failures, um, but there again, a remarkable number of uh, those patients returned to their families and had some kind of a life. Now, it's certainly true that some of the patients became more docile and easier to handle but many of the others were so badly damaged they could never take their place in the world. And of course, some died. This young man is one of Lobotomy's success stories. Cases like his encourage Freeman to extend his practice. He moved from using lobotomies as a last resort to using them on people who by anyone's standards were perfectly normal. Hi there, Howard, I would guess. Hi, I'm Howard Dully. Hello, I'm Michael Mosley. Glad to meet you. And you. So this is your sort of childhood neighborhood, is it? Yes, it is. This is the place. Which way's the house? House is over in here. What were you like as a child? Well, I wasn't an angel. I was uh, very rambunctious. Uh, I liked to roam the streets a lot and like to be alone. I found out if I was alone, I didn't get in trouble. Yeah. You know, because no one was there to get me in trouble. Uh, and I just wanted to be left alone, pretty much, you know. Howard's mother died when he was just five years old. His father married again, but Howard and his new stepmother, Lou, had a very difficult relationship. I felt that she was trying to take the place of my mother, and I right. resented that, so. How did she respond? Uh, she would punish me or do things to me that would aggravate me, so it would just snowball. Once she did something to me, I'd do something back, and pretty soon it just got out of hand. Their relationship got worse and worse to the extent that Lou took Howard to see Dr. Freeman. It was just before his 12th birthday. Do you think she had any appreciation of what a lobotomy would do? I don't know that she cared. I think that she uh, just wanted a solution to me, and whatever that solution brought, she was willing to accept. This picture shows Howard undergoing his lobotomy. I wasn't changed that much, and I was still had my faculties and things. I thought she was going to get more of a docile, uh, robotic-type kid right. that she could control. If the lobotomy was supposed to pacify Howard, it failed. He became increasingly disruptive. Unable to manage him, his parents sent him away from home forever. I had gone to 
several people's homes and then made a ward of a court at juvenile hall. And since I didn't commit a crime, they sent me to Agnews at age 13, 14 years old. And I was put in with adult mentally ill patients. Wow. I just was a kid that had no place to go is what they kept telling me. Right. We have no place to send you. And then I went back to juvenile hall, back on the streets, got in trouble because I didn't have any skills or know how to live. And uh, went back to Agnews till I was 20. It was either that or prison. Do you think Walter Freeman stole something from you? I think he took my childhood. I think he, t he took my childhood and s some of my adulthood because I'm probably about 20 years or better behind the average person. What I'd really like to do is I'd like to take you along to an MRI machine where we can actually have a look inside your brain because I think it is extraordinary. I think you're an extraordinary individual and I'd be very, very interested in who you are in what the MRI machine might reveal. Well, thank you. Of the 100,000 people who were lobotomized, Howard is the first to have a high-resolution MRI scan. I feel privileged to be here. I've seen into parts of you that no one else has ever seen into. Oh, I bet you have. Ooh. Right, take a seat over here. Take a foot. So we have had a good look at your brain. Oh, it's been there I are. absolutely fascinating. Here's the front of his head. This is his yep. eyebrow, his eye, his nose will be over here, the back of his head. Uh, the knife uh, should have gone in above the eye. Right, okay. And then you can see this black region here oh, wow. is, is not normal. That's abnormal, is that it? That is abnormal, yes. Right. See, inside my head I have a black hole. <laughs> there you go. I got two of them, so I'm a third back. Right this way so this instead be of on the side. These huge black cavities were created by Dr. Freeman's instruments. Black hole is the same as this from a different And on both view. sides? Both sides. Right. So what, does, what would that area normally be doing? So the frontal lobes are important for long-term planning, um, inhibition of a response. One of the most obvious things that people who have damage in this part of the brain is uh, they become very impulsive. Right, okay. um, And unable to control their impulses. And that's the paradox, isn't it? They went through all that, they put you through all that, and actually it was the exact opposite of what they were hoping to achieve. Right. It would have made you worse in a funny way. It would have made you much more likely to misbehave. Is that right? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Certainly if you did this to an adult, I would expect them to be permanently impaired and, and right. not be able to control their impulses. Ironically, it was probably Howard's youth that in the end prevented him from going completely off the rails. His young brain was able to rebuild pathways responsible for impulse control and which govern reasonable behavior. The tragedy is that when Howard was operated on in 1960, safer and more effective psychiatric treatments were widely available. Nonetheless, Freeman went on performing lobotomies for many more years, only stopping when he was 72.